Who, who, is, who, who in this group has actually done their own pro se legal work? Oh, this is going to be really fun. Let's see if I can get this thing started up. Yeah, that's my, that's my last step. I want my, actual, my, my screen to be good. It's slow. Okay. It's my computer. Full <clears throat> introduction time. We've got cat food with Hack the Man. Your guide to the courtroom. Cat food, if you please. May it please the court. You always start everything with may it please the court. It's kind of that little, little suck up thing you do just to, just to stroke the judge's ego before anything else happens. And after that, you could be as sarcastic as you want. That's one of the things I discovered. Um, first of all, how, how, are we loving Otacon so far? Great. Yes. Okay. And thanks to Froggy, Tiger, everybody else who's getting it together. We love you. We love you. Keep coming back. I, I love this conference. And, and I've done a radically different presentation every year. And next year will be completely different. So, so come around next year, too. Don't miss it. Um, how many people here follow my Twitter, follow my tweets? Mark, OK. OK. I promised something really special today which is if you come to this presentation, you will actually get to see and meet the least jaded person I know who frequently stars my tweets. So everybody say hi to Sarah. She's the least jaded person I know. See, she's real. The stories are not made up. And, and maybe she'll be able to contribute today because last weekend, she got arrested twice. <laughs> so so ask, her, ask her about that later. It's, it's really cool. And, um, and we can go to court in DC in a couple weeks. All right, fabulous. Um, this is, uh, is going to be a three-part. Oh, let's see if this thing comes on. This is going to be a three-part presentation. Is that on? That? No? Here it comes. Oh, OK. One more. I overshot. Yeah. OK, we're good. OK. Um, this is going to be a three-part three presentation. Uh, first part is what I did. Second part is what I learned. The third part is just going to be the awesome, because the best, the best thing ever is that I got to, uh, when I went to appeals court in December, um, I was really, really nervous. Am I right, Sarah? Most nervous I've ever been in my life. Am I right? Because I've been gearing up to this thing for like four months and uh, four nights at the Cleveland State Law Library, and I thought I was going to mess it up. And when I left, I realized that I pretty much kicked the ass of the city prosecutor who handles all traffic cases. So I was kind of proud of that. That was really cool. So that's my third part is going to be just basically bragging about it. And um, so because it's awesome is a great reason to do anything, and it's a great reason to hack anything. Now, I'll tell you my story. I was. Is that going to move? This is really, really slow. I might have to improvise without slides. Let's see. There we go. One more try. OK, there we go. No. OK, um, I was busted in June of 2010. Bogus stop sign ticket in my old neighborhood. The cop claimed it was a really dangerous intersection. Nobody ever stops at the line, at the stop sign. Um, go back and check. There actually is no line on the street. It's that bad. You know, I figure if, if it's a public safety issue, they probably should have seen to that. But, but anyway, um, I knew this was bogus. And so I, you know, usually, usually you just mail the waiver in, right? And I said, no, this is America, damn it. I'm going to fight this maximum 150 buck traffic infraction. I'm going to take a whole day off work to do it. And I'm going to spend a lot of money at it. So I went to trial in July in, in the Cleveland Municipal Court, and it did not go well. Uh, I pretty much busted the cop for having a contradictory story, and uh, Judge Patton wouldn't let me have it. That's Judge Charles Patton, who's up for re-election in a couple of years. And uh, I, as I was paying my fine, and I'm going to go back to that about paying the fine, don't pay the fine, um, I filed an appeal in August, at the beginning of August, just up to the deadline, at the Ohio Court of Appeals. And they give you, I believe it's 30 days, or 20, 20 or 30 days to file your brief. 
And I just happened to bring a few copies. And these are to share afterwards. I spent, I'm not a lawyer, did I mention that? I spent uh, four nights at the law library at Cleveland State University just down the street from here. And you can really learn a ton. If you go at a law library with Hacker Mind, you can learn a lot and you can do a lot. So, so check this out if you ever have any inkling of doing this yourself. It's, it's really fun. And you can learn from my example. So anyway, I submitted that brief. And I had to wait and wait and wait for the court to schedule oral arguments. So I gave oral arguments in December. And that was simultaneously the most fun thing ever and the most terrifying thing ever. And just to give it some perspective, um, a long time ago, I, I, had a I had a five-year-old who was like basically living at Rainbow Hospital with some, some really nasty illness, and that was not as nerve-wracking as going to appeals court. It is crazy-making because you've got so much time to think about it and so many ways to mess up, and you've got people telling you what to wear, and um, you're not at all sure what you're going to be up against, and you've only got 15 minutes to make your case. So if you, if you botch it, you're done. But the neat thing is, you ever, you ever watch, uh, like on Law and & Order, where Sam Waterston goes to appeals court, and he's got some arcane point of law to argue with the judges? I got to do that. Um, or like the Supreme Court, where the litigants come in, and they've got the nine judges, and the judges interrupt you and argue with your point and cut you off, and you have to, you have to, you have to actually argue with the judges? I got to do that. It was a blast. It was terrifying, but it was a blast. And finally, in February, after we had our verdict party to celebrate winning, like about a week after I got the notification that, that I in fact had won. Uh, we were just kind of going on that speculatively. And I still haven't gotten my fine back. So there's going to be another motion. Can I get to the next page, please? No, I cannot. Just really, really slow. Yeah, how do you like the next page so far? OK. Well, what I'm going to show, yep, here it is. That's my win. I went to the appeals court website basically every Thursday after the oral arguments, and uh, because they only release their opinions on Thursdays, and hitting refresh all day. And finally, in the middle of February, this came up. And, uh, and this, is, this is the key part. I got reversed and remanded, which means the appeals court is telling the trial court, that thing you did, you're going to have to back that out like it never happened. It's like, it's like hitting the cancel button. And uh, so at this point, I'm neither guilty nor not guilty. I'm just, my trial actually didn't count, and it has to be done over. But as you'll see a little bit later on, the, the possibility of the city actually trying to retry this case is kind of slim, because my entire argument was that the cop didn't remember a June traffic bust in July, he's certainly not going to remember June traffic bust the following uh, May. So I think I'm pretty much out of the woods here. Now, the thing about, the reason why I'm bringing this to a hacker conference, are you, are you wondering why this is at a hacker conference? No. You, you, get, you get the hacker aspect of this, right? Yeah. Yeah, because a hacker is somebody who delights in having an, uh, an understanding of the inner workings of a system. And the way I look at it, the legal system is the system. I mean, that, that's the man. That's the system. And so the system has to be a system, right? And, and just like you can learn a computer system or learn any other kind of system, a biological system or whatever, you can learn the legal system. And just like hacking, you don't really have to go to school for it. I mean, if you're hacking computers, you're hacking hardware, you don't necessarily have to have a degree in it. And if you're hacking law for yourself, um, actually, my, my parents never wanted me to be a lawyer. My, my, mother, my mother wanted me to be a priest. Yeah, picture, yeah, picture that, OK? And, and to that end, I took three years of Latin in high school and uh, in, in a semester in college. So I got really good with Latin. So I come here to like recite all the Latin phrases, so I get to say pro se a lot. Um, and I could tell you more about being a priest, but no. Anyway, um, the pro se thing, you can, without any legal training at all, you're allowed to represent yourself. That's, that's what pro se means in Latin, for, for oneself. Um, unfortunately, you can't represent anybody else. 
And, and that's kind of tragic, because I had so much fun with this, I want to do it again. And the only way I get to do this again is to, um, is to get caught arguably doing something illegal, which is kind of not where my life is right now. But learning the inner workings of a system is really cool, but it's especially hackerish, if you ask me, when that knowledge is informally acquired and applied in a weird way. And I think that when you come to the Ohio Court of Appeals with the most trivial case that they've had in the entire year and win, that's kind of cool. I mean, that's the awesome part, right? The key thing here is that everything you learn about hacking still works. Your hacker foo works in the legal system. You don't use your technical knowledge, you, but, but the legal system has an API. It has an API. It has statutes, it has case law, and it has rules. And especially, my argument focused very much on the rules. If you know the rules, it's kind of like playing, uh, it's kind of like playing Gnomic. You ever play Gnomic? Oh man, I'm old. Anyway, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system with rules that you can apply and manipulate. And so you do that in the law system. And, part, and the reason why your hacker foo works, or the way your hacker foo works, is you be curious. You pay attention, you, you learn stuff, you try stuff. Um, you get help if you can, but you especially ask a lot of questions. And hasn't that always worked for you when you hacked? You go to Usenet. Oh crap, I really am old. Okay, you, <laughs> you go to MSDN, I don't know. But you go ask for help, you, go que you, get, you, you uh, ask questions, you get answers, you try things, you find them out. Uh, the downside of trying things out in court and seeing if they work or not is that they don't usually give you a second chance. And specifically, um, jumping a little bit ahead in the story, uh, before going to oral arguments on my appeals case, I, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to sit in on a session of the appeals court. So I took a Monday morning off from work and uh, just from 9 to 12 went to the county courthouse. And this is local, by the way. If you're not from Cleveland, I live in Cleveland. So I'm at the Cuyahoga County Courthouse and I just spent all morning hopping from one appeals courtroom to another, just listening to the oral argument, seeing how people are dressed, where do they stand, what's the protocol, that sort of thing. And I found out some very interesting things. One of them is that about 50% of the appeals in uh, felony cases are by, are post-conviction, they're by inmates who are claiming inadequate representation. And the thing they all had in common is that they all lost. Uh, in other words, you don't really get a second shot at being acquitted on things. You know, if you, didn't, if you messed up your own defense, or if your lawyer messed up your defense, yes, you may have an argument for inadequate counsel, but I'll tell you what, the court's pretty rough on that. They, they want, uh, y your, your counsel's got to be very inadequate for that to be a, a basis for appeal. So where hacking is a little, where hacking computers or software is a little bit different from hacking the legal system is you might only have one shot at the legal system. Just letting you know that, just a little bit of FYI. And a little bit later on, I'll tell you, when it's worth taking a shot at it yourself and when you probably need professional help. But definitely, definitely ask questions. Which reminds me, don't ask me questions because here comes my disclaimer in the next five minutes. I'm not a lawyer. My, the beginning and end of my legal training, oh, is that too small? <laughs> that sucks to be you, doesn't it? Yeah, so trust, no, just trust me, really. The beginning and end of my legal training was um, hanging out in law libraries. I did this, uh, I was a really, really geeky teenager. I'm totally, ser I'm totally serious, I'm not making this up. When I was 17, I used to spend a lot of time, I grew up in Connecticut, I spent a lot of time at the uh, law library at the state capitol, just reading stuff. I was kind of a civil liberties geek and I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I was fun at parties too. Um, and, then, and then spending a little bit of time now at the uh, library, the law library at Cleveland State University, which is, which by the way, is a fantastic law library. It is free to the public. It's open to anyone. It's open till 11 o'clock on weeknights. Um, and uh, it, it's a fabulous resource. And they have LexisNexis on the spot. So what I'm telling you is that I did not go to law school. I just learned a few things. This is just one guy saying what worked for him. Um, specifically, here's a disclaimer. This is not legal advice. Anything that applies to your case personally, you didn't hear from me, I can't represent you. Okay, are we all together on that? Yes? Are we having fun so far? No, we're not having fun. Oh well. 
I figure it's my job to entertain you. Um, also, I've got to I've got to give you a plug. Got to I got to I got to put in one plug. Um, if you're not doing, hello, um, this summer. Oh, did I get a timeout here. Dang. Okay. Well, I'm going to say, uh, if you do anything technical, anything in design work, anything in moving projects along, check out ClevelandGiveCamp.org. It is a cool summer project. Three days hacking websites and software for nonprofit organizations on a boat. Did I mention it's on a boat? This is awesome. Um, if, you're, if you're somewhat local, you can get to Cleveland for a weekend. Come on down. Check out clevelandgivecamp.org. Volunteer sign-up is, is open already. You should totally do it. I'm really unhappy with how this, uh, how this computer is doing. Um, yeah, that's not going to go. Okay, we might have to go kind of informal here. And you can download the slides afterwards. Now, um, in the hacker sense, we all know what ethical hacking is about, right? It's, uh, it's not necessarily doing things that are illegal, it's doing things that are creative, and above all, you want to be ethical about it. And by, uh, by being ethical, I'm saying you may want to take reasonable risks, but you don't want to screw things up for others. Um, and especially that means, in my experience, is be really, really nice to the court clerks, because if you walk into a court clerk office dressed like this, they assume you're a lawyer. And what's the first thing they assume when they see a lawyer walk in making demands? It's getting paid 300 bucks an hour to be an asshole, right? So it's actually very useful in any encounter, especially if you're dressing the part, in any encounter with the system, introduce yourself by saying, hi, I'm cat food, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. It is amazing how their attitude changes when you tell them that you're not a lawyer. On the other hand, judges really hate pro se litigants. It's, it's the fun, am I right? It's the funniest darn thing. You can be as professional as anybody who's actually professional, but when they realize you're representing yourself, they think you're a kook. And they think you're going to come up with some wacky argument. They think you're going to be like one of those tax protesters who thinks that the law doesn't apply to them because the flag in the courtroom has a gold fringe. Have you ever heard that one? Weird conspiracy theory shit. So first thing you got to do whenever you're dealing with the system is let them know that you're actually for real and you're not making this stuff up. Um, have things spelled properly, make deadlines, um, type things for heaven's sakes. The um, one court clerk told me when I was asking about the formatting of a particular document, she said, you don't realize that half of our, half of our petitions are actually handwritten, so you're ahead of the game if you type anything. So try to, put, you know, try to do things the right way, try to make it look good. Um, also, please, don't ever lie. Now, there's a difference between lying and asking a question that has an implication. So keep that in mind if you're, if you're in trial, if you're in, in cross-examination especially, and try to settle for what you can get, especially if you're dealing with any civil matter. Um, a, lot of times, a lot of times, you know, in a civil matter, you're out to get the other person. You know, the, the company didn't pay you, or you didn't get your security deposit back, or whatever, and you really want to send a, you want to send a message, you want to teach them a lesson. You know what, don't. The legal system really sucks for that. The legal system is really good at resolving a dispute and coming to a conclusion. It really, it, it's really bad at anything else. And so if you expect to, to have justice or you expect to be vindicated or you expect everybody to go, oh my god, yes, you're right, that's not going to happen. At best, what you're going to get is your money back or you'll get an injunction ruled on. You know, you'll get the legal result you want, but don't expect anything more out of it. Um, so if you can negotiate things off the table, then that's so much the better. And now by learning about the system, learning about the system, I mean, first off, do your homework. You know, um, if you're filing a brief, if you're making an argument orally in court and you say, you say, for example, in my case, the officer can't really testify because he's already demonstrated he doesn't remember what's happening. That's, that's okay on the spot, but when you're filing a brief, you've got to actually do your homework and back it up with a legal authority that says that. You can't go on common sense unless there's nothing else to go on. If there is a legal citation for what you're trying to say, you should get that legal citation. And specifically, if you're, if you're in this jurisdiction, if you're from Cleveland or local, uh, there are two really, really good works, um, and it, it's encyclopedic, and there's is uh, new issues every uh, year or two, called Ohio Jurisprudence. It's in your law library. It's actually in your public library, too. And West's Ohio Digest, two really, really good um, huge encyclopedic documents, and I'll tell you how to use those in a moment, too. 
Um, it's really important, though, to be detached about what you're doing. Nobody gives a shit if you're right. Nobody cares. Um, and nobody cares about your clever insight on how the system should work. Nobody cares about your idea of how it does work or what somebody told you once or even what you learned on Law and Order or Judge Judy. What they care about is uh, there's a rule and there's an application of the rule and how it applies to your case. Same goes for definitions of words. There's many times in statutes or in case law where a, a word is used, uh, reasonable. Reasonable is a great word. And you have to go and research what is meant by reasonable. Yes, you actually have to go that far sometimes. So much of law is not what you think it should be, but it's what, it's what actually has been ruled on by other courts. And next slide, please. Excellent. Um, so how to deal with potential legal situations that come up. I'll, I'll kind of, I'm going to kind of focus on my stop sign of the century trial because it's kind of cool, but also this applies in general. Um, it's something I think of as, as scene protocol. No, it's not as kinky as it sounds. That um, scene protocol is just what I think of as what you do when you have some encounter with the man, with, the, with officer or with something that could, could create a legal issue. Number one is shut up, really. Answer questions, yes and no. Give the minimum answer you can. You know, one of my favorite ones is when I was legitimately pull over speeding and just paid the silly thing. Officer says, you know how fast you were going? What's your answer to that? He can't say no because then the cop's going to go to court and say he didn't even know how fast he was going. Well, what if you say yes? Cop says he knew he was speeding. You can't win. So you just kind of go, uh huh, how, how fast? What was your reading? I mean, you know, try not to give information if you possibly can because they will, they will use it against you. That's like, I learned that in Law and Order. It's kind of cool. I learned, that in, I learned that in NYPD Blue, actually. Um, I also learned that my nickname was Dog Breath, but that doesn't work. Wait, no. That was Hill Street Blues, right? Dog, anyway, all right. Um, but the key thing is to preserve your rights. Preserving your rights. It's complicated. This is really complicated. So say you're driving along, you get pulled over, there's an open container in your vehicle, I don't know, you, you ran somebody over, you're technically fleeing bail, something like that and you have certain rights. Um, for example, uh, you have the right to freedom from unreasonable search. Unreasonable, that's another word you gotta define, am I right? Uh, there's been decades of case law on what, what a reasonable search means, but there are cases where you have to allow the officer to search your vehicle, search your clothing, whatever. Which leads me to the best ACLU line ever. This is, this is actually a really good one if you ever find yourself in a difficult situation is, direct quote, I do not consent to any search. Because that works for you both ways, am I right? Have you used that? Yeah, is that a great video? Yeah, where, and, <laughs> and the, video, the video is great because, am I right that the car is full of herbal smoke? <laughs> Can I see your license? Yeah, let me press it up against the window. <laughs> Because once the officer, and I'm not recommending anything illegal. Um, once the officer spells something, then the officer has the right to search your car because then the officer has probable cause. Um, and so you, you, know, you don't want to give probable cause if you can help it. Um, you also don't want to waive your rights. And so if any situation, the officer says, hey, mind if I go through your stuff? Or, or hey, can you let me in? You know, can, you, uh, can you unlock your computer for me? That's a request. And so the thing to say is, I do not consent to any search. That protects you two ways. One is if it, if it is a search that the officer is entitled to do, regardless of your consent, you're not giving the officer a hard way to go. Because obviously you don't wanna, you don't wanna get in a angry dispute with a police officer on a scene, am I right? Um, so if it's a search that does not require your consent, okay, it's gonna happen and you can't stop it. If it's a search that does require your consent, then you have declined it. And it's a nice non-confrontational way to preserve your rights as much as you can. Um, likewise, the, uh, the second best, um, and 
I told this to Sarah a little bit too late. The second best line to use in a police situation when you're not sure if you've been arrested is, do you know what the line is? That's a very, that's a, that's a good one, that's a good one, that's close. Am I free to go? Because you want to let them say yes. So if you're in a situation with, with law enforcement and they're asking you a lot of questions and they're standing around you and you're not really sure if it's okay to leave or not, a very good question is, am I free to go? Because they have to answer it on, they have to answer you, right? They can either say, yes, you're free to go, and then you can make a choice. You might want to keep talking, it's up to you. But if they say no, then they have to make a decision whether to arrest you or not and then you force the issue. And again, you've done it in a non-confrontational way. Um, so those are the two, two lines to remember. Am I free to go? And I do not consent to any search. Um, and no, they don't, they don't make you look guilty, okay? The main thing is circumstances are paramount in all of this. Everything you do in law depends on circumstances. Yes? You know, I'll bet that depends on the state and everything. Yeah, in the back. That's really interesting. You're not a lawyer, are you? But you're pretty sharp, right? Excellent. And, and you also know your Fourth Amendment law. Yes, very good. That's changing every day, though, isn't it, Fourth Amendment? It's getting smaller and smaller? Yeah. Yeah, how's that Second Amendment doing? Is that getting smaller, too, or is that getting bigger? Yeah, okay. Rock on. <laughs> so um, in answer to uh, do you have to look them into a lock thing, actually, Number one, I'm not representing you. Can't really answer that directly. Um, but also, um, I'm not real clear on the details of that. The, I think the, the I do not consent to a search is a really good line for that because then if you have to open that, the officer will say, I don't care if you consent, you have to open that or I have to open that for you. And then you haven't, you haven't waived a right. By the way, even if the officer is lying at that point, which happens, if the officer is lying at that point, then you also potentially have an out. You've preserved your right to dispute that search. If you waive your right to, uh, if you waive your right against a search, and then later on in the process, you're being prosecuted for that or anything, you cannot raise the issue of, they shouldn't have searched my glove box because they will testify that you waived it and you can't argue it at trial. So it's always good to give yourself that out. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in any kind of hostile way, in all seriousness. It's just that you have certain rights and technically a free country, it's, it's up to you to defend those rights. Um, now, and by the way, before we get too far into the weeds, and I did promise at the free view too that I'd tell you when you need to back off this thing and actually get a lawyer. And um, I've got a very simple protocol for that is what's the worst that could happen? Uh, if the worst that could happen is something that you personally, that exceeds your risk level, your, your risk tolerance, then you should get professional help. And I don't mean a shrink, I mean a lawyer. Um, get, you know, find a lawyer who's competent, who works in your jurisdiction. Um, so for example, you know, if you got a couple points in your driver's license and you get pulled over speeding, look, what, the worst that could happen is 150 buck fine and costs. Not that big a deal. Um, you know, you haven't been married that long, it's been a couple of years, you didn't have kids, maybe, don't necessarily need a lawyer, um, um, small claims disputes in this state, anything under $3,000, honestly, don't waste your money on a lawyer, not important. Um, and to that end, especially, it's really important 
in, in business dealings, I found to take things off the table preemptively. And I do a lot of software consulting. It is a really fun business. I haven't had a real job in like 15 years. It's great. Um, and I used to have rather informal contracts. And that really bit me once uh, about 10 years ago when um, total handshake contract for a fairly, you know, fairly decent sized project and I wasn't get paid. And you know, so there was some back and forth between me and the client about this. And uh, next thing I know, I've gotten served with, your project sucks, we're in the hole for $10 bazillion and you owe us. And specifically in their claim was, we don't even know how much money we lost. It's just unlimited. Now that's crazy, but if it's out there, you have to defend it. Oh, from, from then on, every contract, uh, I, I write my own contracts because I'm weird that way, every contract has a liability limit, which basically says, at the most, I owe you your money back and nothing else. And people are always okay with signing that. Now, how would that have played out differently if this difficult client said, I want my money back at the most? Well, that takes millions of dollars off the table, right? Which gives me a lot more room to negotiate. So taking things off the table is a really good thing to do. That just applies to anything, whether it's criminal, civil, or otherwise. So that's the, that's the scene protocol, whether it's a business scene, whether it's a misdemeanor scene, whether it's a, a, you know, a felony scene, anything like that. You know, know to preserve your rights. Same thing happens in trial court. If you are in a trial situation of any kind, civil or criminal, um, number one, above all, there is a protocol there is a way to preserve your rights. Here's a way to not preserve your rights is ex parte nonsense. I had this small claims case. Does it sound like I'm in court all the time? I'm really not. But um, I'm just a lot older than I look. And um, small claims case long time ago. And the other party complained at trial that the judge was never returning his phone calls. You may laugh. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the judge was just, you know, just boggled. It's like, you can't call me. I'm the judge. You cannot have a one-to-one a one -one conversation with the, off with the judge. Um, and that actually happens fairly frequently. Um, contested pro se divorces get that a lot, is what I hear, is you know, somebody's so overwrought about the situation that they actually like, call the judge or they send the judge's letters. You can't do that. And it only makes you look, it makes you look crazy, and it does not help you. Um, also in court. Fancy pants talking does not help you. There's, there's no, you know, none of this, <laughs> the party of the first party. Knock that right off. Nobody cares. They don't want to hear the big words. But what really does matter is having a point. Um, a lot of times, if you're just, uh, if you're just watching, a, and yes, it is kind of a hobby of mine, if you're watching in civil court, you're watching small claims, whatever, somebody will be making this involved legal argument, but you don't know what the hell they're asking for. And that's where emotions are your friend. When you make a motion in writing, you have to ask for relief, which is a term for what you want the court to do. If you're just venting or if you just want to be right or you just want to dispute something the other side is saying, they don't care. They want to know, so what? And so you have to have a point. You, have to, you cannot file a motion without a claim for relief in it somewhere. Um, and that's part of knowing the rules. Very important. And I'm having, I, this is hard to explain, but the rules are, you have to know the rules and the rules are not what you want the rules to be. The rules are not what you think they should be or what you heard they were. The rules are what is in the book and what is in case law. And those rules can work for you or against you. Gosh, I wish my computer were working because I would show you that you can Google the term local, local rules in the name of your court. And you can always get all the local rules. It's very interesting. Certain motions that are in order or out of order at certain times, deadlines for filing things, stuff like that, all in the local rules. If you follow the rules and the local rules, you will be fine. Um, and also very key is there's no gotcha win. You know what I mean? You know, it's not, you know, it's like sometimes you see in really bad TV shows where, you know, a case turns on something not being signed. Actually, I had to. I'm just thinking of this now. I, had a, I worked for a big client a few years ago where they, um, um, long after I worked for them, uh, they were sued on some other project that didn't go well. 
and one of their defenses was, no, 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 we didn't sign the contract because the copy of the contract that was introduced into evidence didn't have their officer's signature on it. Guess how far they got with that? No, everybody knew darn well there was a contract. They just didn't happen to have that particular copy signed. And in fact, they'd been behaving for the previous eight months as though there had been a contract. You can't go back and say, ha ha, I didn't sign it. No, the law does not work that way. Um, and I can go into contract law, but it's not that interesting right now. The main thing is, preserve your rights, make objections when you have to. Especially in a trial situation, you cannot appeal any issue that you do not raise at trial. And so when I back up the story about the stop sign of the century, you'll see how that worked out pretty well. There is an exception to that. There's an illegal doctrine called plain error. Plain error means something is so egregiously unfair on the part of the trial court that it doesn't matter if you raise an objection. And in my specific case, on appeal, I raised the issue of um, the fact of the judge imposing the maximum fine because he was pissed off at me. And I did not object on the spot, but I had case law that indicated that that is, a case, that is an example of plain error. So I can, so I can make an appeal on that point. Um, and especially, especially um, I want to say, in terms of preserving your right, if you think, and this is something I almost got bitten by. Actually, I did get bitten by it, but I survived. Which is, if you're in a, um, if you're in a um, criminal situation, down to the misdemeanor level, including traffic, if you think there was something wrong with the trial, do not pay the fine. Okay? I almost lost my appeal on this point. That if, um, if the judge bangs a gal and says, find you guilty, pay $150 in cost, pay the clerk on the way out, don't. Ask for, immediately move for a stay so that the sentence is not imposed right away. Ask for a stay pending appeal. Um, the appeals court almost threw out my case on that basis. They found a technicality to keep it in, which was kind of cool, but I had no idea. I had no idea that was even going to be an issue. Um, how are we doing for time? 15 left? Okay, fabulous. Okay, and if you want to talk about this some more, um, we've got the breakout session immediately upstairs. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So moving right along, if you do need to appeal a case, research is the key and sticking to the facts of the case. Um, doing legal research is almost exactly like doing a math proof, which is kind of awesome because I have a bachelor's in math. And there is a, there is a way you get from a, from the you start with the conclusion you want and show a path, show the appeals court the path to the conclusion you want. And there's a little thing they teach you in law school, which I stole, even though I didn't go to law school. Um, they call it they call it CREXAC. It's really easy to remember CREXAC. It stands for Conclusion, Rule, Explanation, Application, and then the Conclusion again. C-R-E-X-A-C. -E you start, when you write your brief, you start on the point of error you wish to make, and you state your conclusion. My conclusion was that the officer should have been excused from testifying because he didn't actually remember anything he was testifying to. That's the conclusion. And then I found the rule. The rule, found through research, was a specific old an 80-year-old case that, that laid that out, that even if a witness has read the thing he's testifying from, that's allowed, but if he still doesn't recall, doesn't actually recall what he's reading about, then he still can't testify. That is a rule from Beerbaum v. State, 1928. You explain that in your brief, and you demonstrate how that applies. You match up the facts. The facts and the precedent match my facts. The facts and the precedent match my facts. Therefore, here's my conclusion. Um, and the way to get started in legal research, the, again, in Ohio, the two most awesome resources you can get are West's, W-E-S-T apostrophe S, Ohio Digest, which is this encyclopedia of Ohio case law, or Ohio jurisprudence. They're like basically competing publications, and they're laid out like encyclopedias. So if you want to do research on an appeal or research on a, on a case at trial, you just look for the topic that's interesting to you. And I go, OK, well, let me go over to West Ohio Digest, and I'll just grab uh, witnesses. It's in W's. And I, there's like three books of witnesses. And you can just pour through, and there's paragraph after paragraph of summaries of the high points of case law and with some detail. And each one has a cross-reference to the actual published cases that support you. How cool is that? So. In my case, I said, oh, I've got a witness who doesn't remember the facts to which he is testifying. 
keep scanning through and I found, you know, found a paragraph ex explaining that. And then it gives you the case citations, which are in a certain format, which I can't show you right now. Uh, and you just chase those down in the library. And actually, if you're local, there's a room in the Cleveland State Law Library called the Ohio Room, which has all of your stuff in one place. It's very cool. Um, and you follow a cookie trail. Now, there's a cookie trail on top of the cookie trail, which is every case you read in the, uh, in the authoritative books. I know, it's getting really dry now, isn't it? And, and every case may have been superseded, may have, had, may have been applied in a different way, may have even been uh, you know, just uh, essentially stricken. And that's where you want a book called Shepherd's Citations. And this used to be done manually. Believe it or not, they have a book that is just line after line of every single case in the law books followed by a cross-reference to where it might have been affected by a future case. It looks like, it looks like random numbers. It's, it's this weird little book. But if you're planning on citing a case in your brief, you want to see, you know, you're going to look pretty dumb if you cite a case in your brief that has since become obsolete. So you can follow it down in the shepherd's book. So you shepherdize that. I am so old school, I shepherdize by hand. They can do it online now. I don't bother. I think it's cooler to do it in hard copy. So um, that's, how, that's how appeals work goes. And so what happened was this. I'm at trial. I knew, I knew a little bit, because I'm a sucky driver. And, um, and you can use everything on the record. It's kind of awesome. And um, the prosecutor tried to plea bargain me down to a chipped windshield. And I'm like, dude, I'm not pleading to a chipped windshield, because you know, cause it got, it's got no points. And I said, but my windshield wasn't chipped, and I didn't run the stop sign either. And so on the record, on the record, the prosecutor said to the judge, we couldn't make a deal. Um, I, tried to, I tried to give him a lesser, um, a lesser offense. He's got a pretty good record. I was willing to do it. He said he's got a pretty good record, so I got like some, some juice on the sentencing. And how, is our, and how are we doing for time here? Ten. Ten. Fabulous. Okay. And is the, is the next speaker trying to get in here? Okay. How, how are we doing for time? Okay, let, let me know, just start coughing, okay? Okay. Because <laughs> you saw what the last guy did, am I right? Yeah, that's messed up. So, um, so actually, I just asked the cop a few questions. I said, look, you know, do you remember, you know, the time, the time you pulled me over there, um, you know, um, were you, like, following me down, down Archwood Avenue and, and saw me, you know, saw me flying through that stop sign? And the officer said, no, actually, I was at a right angle. I was parked on 39th Street. And I said, but, but you said... You said on the scene that you'd been following me, and he said, "Oh, that's you know." And then the prosecutor's objecting. This is true, and um, I asked the cop a few more questions. He's got the citation in front of him, and I said, um, "Was there anybody else in the car with me?" I don't recall. Uh, was there anything? Was there a chipped windshield on the car? <laughs> I don't recall. Um, did we have? Do you remember the conversation we had when you pulled me over? He said, "I don't recall." Uh, what color was the car? And he said, I don't, oh wait, on the ticket it says black. <sighs> okay, at this point I've already won, right? Um, so we go on, I ask a few more questions, and I ask him about the uh, specific, uh, I ask him some more details that we don't have time for right now. And when I'm done, I just say, and again, fancy words don't matter, fancy words don't matter. I just say, your honor, I move to have the, officer, uh, have the officer's testimony stricken because he obviously can't testify to something that he doesn't personally remember. He just said he doesn't remember so many of these things. Judge wouldn't let me have it. I'm going, ooh, I've got grounds for appeal here, don't I? I don't know the case law, but I know that doesn't look right. And um, when, I, when I take my side of the story, because I get to testify for myself, I started to explain some of the circumstances of getting pulled over, and I kept getting cut off by the judge because he wanted to move the trial along. I was really polite. I didn't point out that the reason why we were running late that morning was because he showed up 20 minutes late. Sometimes I can hold it in. I just, it's sometimes difficult. And anyway, um, just visibly annoyed, visibly annoyed, the, uh, the judge said on the record, let's move this along. We don't have time for this. Just go ahead and plead out already. Okay, he didn't say that. But he ruled against me and said it's gonna be 150 bucks in costs. Which, by the way, turns out to, that's like 290. Court costs are insane in this town. And so I'm on, you know, so I'm on the hook for 290, 300 bucks. And I foolishly paid it. And then when I filed my appeal, yeah, yeah. 
when I filed my appeal, that does not preserve your right to appeal because you have accepted the judgment. It's kind of like you've been to prison and they can't undo that, which I think is funny because they can write you a check back. I don't get the logic there. So I went to appeals court and did, you know, filled out this thing. And I got my decision back with the reversed and remanded, and, and, the, and the appeals court said something very interesting, um, which they didn't exactly bring up before, and the, certainly the prosecutor didn't bring it up, which was that you don't have an appealable order if the sentence has already been executed, even if it's a fine. But because it was an offense with points, that's called a continuing disability under the law. I'm not real clear what that is, but it doesn't matter. Because in other, I was still serving a sentence, in, in effect. I still had my two points. If I still have my two points, it's still appealable. And so that was, my, that was my open door to actually get the appeal in. That was not raised specifically and directly up until that point, but I'm really glad that one of the judges saw it that way. I never would have thought to claim that. So um, basically, I made five points of, I, I asserted five points of error. The first one being, you can't testify if you don't remember what you're testifying to. Second point of error being that, and this is a, a fine line, but if you are, if you choose to refresh, as a, if as a witness you choose to refresh your memory by reading something on the stand, then you must first lay the foundation that you do not remember. Very interesting point of Ohio law. You cannot testify from a written document until you first say, I don't remember, and the judge accepts that. Very interesting point. Third one, um, the judge can limit your ability to cross-examine a witness on a collateral matter, such as were you following me or weren't you, um, and the judge has discretion on that, but the judge does not have the discretion when, check this out, when you're questioning a cop. Is that interesting? There's federal case law on that. What's really awesome about doing legal research is that that particular case law is from a drug dealer. I also, I also used case law that applied to rape and murder cases. <laughs> that was kind of fun. But anyway, um, for, um, <laughs> the fourth assignment of error, man, I, oh, the fourth, fourth assignment of error was that I was denied a fair trial because the judge was impatient to move it along and denied due process. That was a rape case, by the way. And the fifth assignment of error was that the judge broke the uh, sentencing guidelines by giving me the back sentence, even though the prosecutor said I didn't have a bad record. Um, so anyway, I filled out in the brief. The appeals court agrees with me on the first two points and renders the rest moot because it doesn't matter, I won already. Um, so that's how it ended. That's cool. I still haven't gotten my check back from the city. I don't know if I ever will. <laughs> and I'd be happy to answer questions about this or shoot the bull or talk about your legal fun and games with the understanding that I'm not a lawyer. And we'll do that upstairs in what room, sir? Case. In the case. That's awesome. That's like a law school. Okay, we're going to be up in the case room right now. We'll talk. We'll hang out. It's great. Thank you all for hanging out. See you upstairs.